Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife and empowers you to live a more vibrant second half. If you find yourself on YouTube today, please subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any more conversations. And if you're on a podcast platform, go ahead, subscribe, rate, and share my podcast so more people can get in on these incredible conversations. Now, our conversation today is going to be about what happens when you hit your 50s and life is just not what you expected it to be. My guest today really wanted things to change when she hit 55 years old. She completely changed her life, took a different direction. She went back to school. She changed her marriage. She thought about writing a book, ended up writing the book just a couple of years ago. She's 70 years old now, and she wants to empower other women to realize that there's so much life to live and you can do anything that you put your mind to. Today, I'm speaking with Jill Phillips. She's the author of Lamb Lash Street, a portrait of 1960s post-war London through one family's stories. Jill is 70 years old and she is on her way to doing even more amazing things. So I thought you would enjoy her. Jill, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. So I'm super inspired because you were telling me a little bit about your story before we hit record. And I was asking you, you know, what were those things that led you to this place at 55 to just completely change your life? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey because I, I didn't see myself as being somebody who would be making many changes. In fact, I was somebody who was fairly, I was a good girl. Um, I, I did what I should do. I, I followed all the rules. And I got to be in my mid-50s, and I was really unhappy. Um, I wasn't happy with my life. Um, I wasn't happy in my marriage, which wasn't, you know, it doesn't help. But I wasn't happy with myself. I felt I'd done all the right things in life. You know, been a good mother, and you spend all your time, you know, focusing on your, your children and and you um, you do well with your career, and you know I ticked all the boxes the way I was taught. And so I got to be in my mid fifties. I thought I don't like this. I can't imagine spending the rest of my life being this unhappy. Um, I was depressed. Um, I was. I was. You could see on my face. I really wasn't having a happy time. And so um, it started gradually. It's something like this. You don't suddenly say, oh, I'm going to change overnight. You start reading the self-help books. You know, you get some ideas. And um, I was in a working in a professional capacity. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should start by at least maybe, maybe I'll get my, my master's degree, master's of science degree. And I thought, well, no, no, no. You come from a working class background. Nobody in your family's got anything like this what are you, you thinking to yourself? And I thought, so I spoke to a lot of people about it. And the long short of it is I went for it. Um, I did a couple of single courses because I hadn't done any academics in decades. <laughs> and I've got A grades for those. Um, and I thought, wow, I didn't know I could do this. And then I, I went into the, the full program. And then I decided to do the option of a thesis, partly because I'd never done a thesis before. In fact, I had to look it up to see exactly what that meant. <laughs> And so, um, and I had a great time. I was a whole time. I was gradually building my confidence. Um, I was doing well academically, and I was always pretty good academically when I was in school. Um, and I was keeping up with these these fellow students who were probably young enough to be my my grandchildren. Uh, and yeah, I was doing okay. Um, and when it came to graduating, I went to the convocation. I had my my gown on and my hat, my the mortarboard hat, and that which I'd never done before. Um, and I walked across that stage and I got my my my, my piece of paper there. Um, so that was the beginning. That, that really changed things a lot for me. And then after that happened, um, the, the, as I said, the relationship wasn't going well. Well, that, that fell apart. And so we, um, we parted ways. Um, and then I had a health scare. So this all happened fairly really close together in terms of years. I um, had a health scare. And it was quite a serious one, and, like, and you need surgery. It's like, oh, good grief. Um, anyway, I got through that. And what I learned from that was um, I was thinking, well, I can't do this by myself because I'm single now, basically. And, but what I learned was all my new friends that I was um, gathering as I went through, they were very supportive. So I learned that, you, yes, sure, you can hold on to the past, 
And you can think, well, well, I can't leave that person because, but you find there's tons of people out there that can't wait to help you. And people were so nice to me. I, I learned that strangers were actually going to be nicer to me in some ways than some people that, you know, you'd have issues with over the years. Um, so I got through that and then uh, I'd had a few pounds put on, I'd put on 40 pounds um, over the years. So I, I lost that. I went, I got a personal trainer, which I'd never done before. How um, old were you when you did that? Oh, I was probably 61 when I did that. <laughs> That's amazing. I love I it. I thought I was absolutely mad, right? Um, but the <laughs> thing is, when you don't have anybody um, in your life who's giving you negative messages, um, you say, you know, maybe I will do this because, you know, I, I got that degree and I know the um, grad degree and that seems to go, okay, well, maybe I'll try this. So I did it. So I went to the personal trainer twice a week for a, about 18 months, lost all the weight. Um, felt fitter than I've, I've felt in years and years and years because uh, I was eating healthier as well. Um, and then I had a, I'd sort of like my hair was starting to turn grey at that point. So I was sort of doing a little bit with it. It's brown. And then I thought, no, the hell with this. I'm going to go full blonde. <laughs> so <laughs> the whole thing went blonde. And from years of having my hair cut really short, I grew it longer. Uh, so I was doing all these things I really wanted to do. And I didn't realise how... Um, you can be held back if you don't have the right people in your life. Mm. And I think that's one thing I learned. And also, as I said, I learned if you get out there, there's tons of people that really want to help you. My, my, my personal trainer was brilliant. I, I went to her one day, I said, um, I'm thinking of running a 5K. And I thought, oh, it's just nothing, I'm too old, wait for it now. She said, oh, that's okay. Why do you just go check with your doctor? And so I talked to my doctor. I said, um, what are you doing here today? Um, I, I'm thinking of running a 5K. And she said, Okay, she said, um, yeah, if, do you mind doing a stress test? I said, no, no, I don't mind. So I did the stress test and she patted me on the head, said, no, that's fine, off you go. So then I started uh, practicing to, you know, to run a 5K. So the first couple of weeks I was doing this, I only ran, I, I did like circles, I called for my own circles. I usually like walk around, like a walking track. Um, and I, I used to run for six steps because that's all I could do. <laughs> and I'd, I'd walk the rest. And then every time I sort of got to where the clock was on the wall of this this track, I'd, I'd run six steps. And that's literally how I started. Um, my personal trainer said, well, let's do these extra exercises, build up your leg strength. And so I did that. And then at the end of, I think it's about two years later, and my trainer, um, they had a park run. I don't know if you've heard of park runs. These free 5K runs, all volunteer um, organization. And um, I happened to be over in the UK because I was living in Canada at the time. Um, I was over in the UK seeing my mum who was getting up in years. So I was you know, keeping close tabs on her really. And I went down to the parks park run. And so I ran this 5K and there must be like 300 people there. I've never been to anything like this before. I had my gym gear on, not knowing quite what I was doing. <laughs> And they shot off like they're in the Olympics. And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I doing? But I thought, no, I'm gonna do this. And, and I was literally the last person to cross the line. <laughs> they have what they call tail walkers. It's like the last people to scoop you up, right? To make sure nobody's <laughs> left behind. And I, I was walking along with them at the end. But you know what? I did it and then I kept going back. And every week I got a little bit faster. And I, I think in the end, after over about two months, I, I took about five or six minutes of my time. So I wasn't the last one at that point. And then unfortunately <laughs> COVID hit and then the whole thing sort of fell apart. And I'm, I'm actually right now getting back in to get back into running again. But I didn't think I would do any of that stuff in life. Um, and so what happened for me is it you build the confidence. Like I say, the, mm. the degree was important. The divorce, getting through that was important. Getting through the health scale was important. Um, losing the weights and then running the 5K. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's it's built and built to the point that um, I've been in the UK now for three years. I came over here for two months <laughs> and I wasn't planning to stay. And then COVID hit and then we all got restricted. And uh, now I'm going to stay here for a while. <laughs> so um, it looks like I'm moving back to the UK for at least for a while. Didn't think I'd do that either. Isn't um, that fascinating? I mean, I listen to your story and I'm I'm in my mind drawing this like timeline of what you went through. And I'm hearing these themes, right? It's that hitting a point where you realize, who am I? You know, 
who am I now? Not that what we did in the past wasn't important, but now who am I? A lot of women hit this point after 50. And then you talked about support and community. That's a really common theme that people that I talk to on my podcast touch on. And I loved the idea that you shared that there's more people willing to help you than you realize. Like that's such an encouraging thing and, it, and, and the courage that it took for you. It sounds like your life was maybe not as globally um, expansive before you hit this point. Am I right? Oh, that's right. Yes. I mean, I've done quite well within my profession. Um, I was a very academic person and I, I did, you know, so within the the confines of work, um, I did quite well. So and I was a manager, hospital manager in, in Canada for 30 odd years. Um, and, and I did you know, a fair job with that. And I became a provincial representative as well on, on my professional board. So I, I done well there. But then when you step outside that and, um, you know, even, for example, relationships, you know, so I was divorced. So then I had to start dating. And it's like, how do you date at my age? And <laughs> I, I, I dated a lot because I had a, an awful lot to learn about people and about how you present yourself. And um, I read everything I could about dating and what's right and what's wrong. Then I came to the conclusion that you just had to get out there and experience it. Um, and it, it took me a long time, for example, to build up confidence, even going out on a date, meeting with strangers, you know, meeting a man who's a stranger and you're there, you know, eventually to have some sort of romantic thing. Um, and after 30 years of being in a very different environment, it's like, wow, can I do this? But I just had this need to push myself to, to do this because I think, as I said earlier, I felt like I'd missed out on life mm. in so many ways. I'd missed out on the fun. Um, yeah, sure, I'd done the academic stuff. But I've missed out on the fun and the laughter and the um, those warm, fuzzy things that have real meaning. Um, my quality of life was poor and now it was getting better and better. Uh, and now it's to the point where I, and I laugh at myself more now. I think I was very hard on myself, which a lot of us are. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be perfect doing everything. Um, like I said, with the 5K, I was the last one to cross the line. But, and that would have bothered me a while ago. Now it's, it's just, it's an interesting story. It's something about your life. You can say to someone, yeah, do you know what? This is what I did. Um, and people listen to what you have to say because they sense as well that you don't take yourself too seriously mm -hmm. and I was a very serious person very serious um, um but I think some of it has been interesting and just touch on the book it's because the book was a story of, of, of me um in that one year between 62 and 63 but a lot of it is about my mother and what I learned from the book was I learned that my mother had been a very determined and focused lady and so when I was going through and, and took a look at the family stories and writing down what we did and how mum would encourage us to be good academically, and it was like, no, you have to do this now, very focused, very determined, I realised that's where I got all the, those good behaviours from because like once I started that degree, I was not going to fail. No, failure was not an option, certainly. And I've carried through that. And I didn't realize how much I'd picked up on what my mother's attitude towards life had been early in life. And now mm -hmm. later in life, that's really a part of what's keeping me moving forward. And like I say, it doesn't have to be the best or the, mm -hmm. the fastest or whatever it is, but finish what you start. Um, and then you meet new people along the way and you become a different person. I'm a different person now from what I was 10 years ago. And That's so encouraging because yeah. we do feel stuck, don't we? Like, you know, we have these stories in our head that this is the person that I like. You just shared this. Your mom said, this is how you do this. This is how you behave. This is how you show up in the world. And they weren't bad things, but your personality went all in. You you like went double down on the obedience, the uh, achievement, the seriousness, right? Oh, yes. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and I now. I, yeah. Now, I mean, uh, um, when I came over like a couple of years ago, my cousin, he's only 18 months older than me, he said, Jill, you've changed so much. When we go out, we have a laugh, we giggle. The photographs of me now um, on the phone and that are of somebody who's laughing and animated and, uh, you know, I'm pointing to things. I don't just say, oh, take my photograph. It's, I'm, I'm more of myself. 
Um, and like I said, I laughed more. I've laughed more in the last 10 years. I think I've laughed the whole of my life prior to that. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's been really good. And um, the book has helped simply because it's another thing I didn't think I could do, but it also helped me reflect on where I'd come from, what my roots were. And that was really good as well. So um, at this point in my life, like 10 years on, I've got this list of stuff that I've done. And um, I, I can't wait to, I can't decide what to do next. I mean, I've already, I've got an electric car here now. Uh, so I've, I've mastered driving on the other side of the road again, on the left side of the road, on these really narrow streets here. We have like <laughs> a hair width between you and the other car, as opposed to Canada, where you've got lots of space. Um, and, you know, I could have said, well, you know, I'm getting on a bit now. No, I'm not going to bother driving, you know. Like, no, no, have this. I'm going to do this, you know. So um, I'm having the time of my life, really, to be honest, because um, life is so much more fun than you realise. And if you just let it sort of unfold for you, it takes you in places you never thought it would. I mean, I never planned to write a book. That wasn't anything. I just wanted to write some of my family stories down. Uh, and then somehow, like, where the life you know, unfolded, um, I'm a published author, whatever that means. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think I've learned that as well. Don't fear life. Don't fear the future. Just roll with it. Mm. And you'll be amazed at who shows up in your life and what happens at the time you need it. And I've read that before and I thought that's so much rubbish. Like, what are they talking about? And yet that's exactly what's happened. Um, when I, I was thinking about the book and I don't, I've sort of done part of it. Um, this company that I'm, st I'm still with, they helped me with the editing and so on. They'd only just started up at the point when I was writing my book and I was one of their first clients. So that that's like a serendipity thing. Um, and, you know, when my poor mother passed on and she left the house that I'm in right now to myself and my brother, um, and I thought, oh, well, I suppose I'll, because I, it's, it's, the house is here really expensive, so I couldn't quite afford to buy my brother out. My cousin stepped in and said, oh, I have some extra cash. And so he did that. So I'm still in the same house. And my cousin helped me buy it. So, you know, that sort of thing happens. And I didn't foresee any of this. So um, it, it's it, once you get to that point in life where you're just willing to let it happen, um, you know, some tough things happened as well. But on the whole, it's been great because I've done more than I ever thought I would. And you get the confidence to move forward then. So you've had a 15-year, like, light <laughs> light years of experience you just kind of hit the accelerator at 55 and you haven't looked back is what it sounds like oh I've learned so much about what I didn't realize I didn't know um I've learned so much about people um how to communicate better with people um about life um I've learned I, I could write a book about it because there's so much I, I didn't realize I knew because I've been so focused on being the good girl um and now it's like I have a bit of fun. And then there's been some raised eyebrows in the family. Um, I mean, for example, when I said I was going to write a book, I said, I said oh, I'm, I'm writing a book, you know. And I said, um, uh, okay, so what's the weather like tomorrow? <laughs> 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 Nobody supported me in, in the family. I've like lost my mind, right? Uh, but now they've adjusted to the new me. You know, I'm not who I was. I'm this more outgoing person and I, I um I dress the way I like to dress. I don't dress the way I should dress sort of thing. Um, and, and now if I do something, they don't question it. It's like, oh, okay. So people do adjust to your new version of doing things. Um, it may take them a while, but they, they do get used to it in the end. <laughs> it sounds like it has afforded you a lot of not just physical freedom, but emotional and mental freedom. This shift has really kind of opened up just like your perception of yourself, your perception of the world. And it sounds like it's been very empowering for you to begin the journey because like you said, you have this list of things, but it didn't start out as a list, right? No, no, not the least. No. Um, what I do now is I express my needs much better. Mm. Um, I was very closed down. Um, but once I started to get out there and try a few things, um, then, um, I now know I know how to sit down with somebody and say, look, um, this is a problem. Uh, we need to talk about this. I, I can know how to change my voice so it's not threatening, all these sorts of things. So I've learned so much about how to communicate with people. Um, and it, it's, it's been, um, it's, it's, it has, I, I feel like I've taken 
a whole lifetime's worth of knowledge of how to um, have a relationship with people and, and sort of got it into like 15 years. It's been like a, a condensed course, really. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's fun and it's good. I'm, 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 I'm in a good place now and um, I'm happy all those things happened. At the time, they weren't easy, some of them. Mm. Um, and it takes you a long, long time to pack up one way of, of living and and just at the time when everyone else is saying, well, I'm, I'm going to be retired soon. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm winding down. And so if you're the person who's not winding down, you're doing the opposite. Um, even the people that love you are really concerned about you because they'd much rather you were winding down as appropriate for your age group. <laughs> um so um that's so annoying that whole appropriate for your age group it's like oh yeah who wrote this rule down anyway like where did that even come from because the potential that we have i'm, I'm listening to your story and thinking look at all that untapped p- potential like yes, that yeah. you didn't even know you could do and every person has untapped potential right Oh, it's massive. You you don't know until you start on this road what, well, even just in terms of appearance. I always thought myself as being dowdy and um, not terribly attractive. And now I've learned, yes, there's lots of things about me that people like. Um, and I thought, what, this is not supposed to be happening in your 60s, you know, or no, nearly 70, <laughs> right? It's not supposed to be happening that way. You're supposed to be like this when you're 17, not when you're decades later. And I thought, no, I, I don't care. Um, if one person hears my story and says, you know what, I'm going to try that and I didn't think I could do it, my day is made. It's lovely. Um, because I think there's too many people out there with saying to us, oh, your time of life, why don't you just take it easy? Why don't you um, get a pet? Because I said, look, I'd love to get married again and I'd love to be you know, in a relationship. And the number of times people say to me, why don't you get a cat? It's like, I don't want a cat. <laughs> you know, it's not what I have in mind. But they wouldn't say that to somebody 30 years earlier. Um, so why is it okay to say it to me? I don't understand this. Um, so yeah, there's tons. I mean, I started to play golf last year and I think I've got the highest handicap in the whole club. <laughs> I mean, I, I with the ladies that are not terribly good. Yeah. Golf is hard. Golf is hard. I've taken oh, lessons. Oh. Now, my sister-in-law is one of the top players. Oh. <laughs> so there's a lot of family pressure. And and my brother's good as well, but it, it's not genetic, I can tell you, because I'm terrible at it. <laughs> um, but you know what? I, I play golf. And even if it's really muddy, I'll play nine holes instead of 18. But I'm still out there with my golf clubs. I uh, still know when on a Wednesday morning I, I get my big golf my golf club bag and I heft it into the car and off I go. And part <laughs> of my brain is thinking, well, Joe, you know, at your time of life, you should probably should be lifting this much this heavy. Oh no, never mind about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I don't like ageism. I hate it with a passion, to be mm-hmm. honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I guess it partly I think it's my occupational therapy background where you mm. you you never looked you didn't look at somebody's disability you always look to what they could do their their functional abilities so if you're in a wheelchair sure but you can still drive you know you, you don't see that as a restriction so I don't see age as a restriction um I think what you have to do as you get older you have to be more careful about what you eat and and how you treat your body and keep your fitness level up but if your fitness level is really good then you should be able to do the same thing as somebody 20 years younger I don't see that being a a barrier at all um so if you say based on my age that I should not be doing something I get very annoyed (laughs) that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to have you on the show is because I'm looking for those women who are like older than me living a vibrant life and can actually say you can do this it's different than someone in their 30s and 40s saying you can do this at when you're 70. I mean I'm, it's great that they're encouraging but to find someone ahead of me who's actually living out that mantra of I don't want to slow down. I'm with you on that because I've been I've had that said to me and I'm only 55. So it's like <laughs> oh and by the time this is aired I'll be 56 and it's like well when are you going to slow down? What do you mean when am I going to slow down? 
what if I want my foot on the pedal until I die? Like, what if that's the way I want to go out? Because I don't, I don't prefer, I had like downtime, but I don't want to down life. Does that make sense? Like I want to experience things and enjoy. Yeah. I totally hear you. And I don't understand where that comes from. I don't know why we expect this whole decline in, in effort and energy in life in general so soon. I don't uh, for me, if, if, if I'm say, for example, I'm feeling extra tired that day, the first thing I'll think of is, did I get enough exercise in the day before? You know, or am I sort of becoming more of a couch potato? Followed <laughs> by, um, uh, am I eating the right foods? Am I mm. eating nutrient dense foods so I get the right, you know, my, macronutrients in my body and those sorts of things? So I never look at say, oh, you know, my age what can I expect? I don't say that. I say, okay, something about my lifestyle is not supporting my need for more energy. Mm. Um, like this week I went to, I was really keen on, on, on upping my exercise <clears throat> to the point that I'll probably sleep really well tonight, <laughs> but <laughs> I won't ever say to myself, oh, I should not do that, you know, because, you know, that big birthday is coming up and, and I, I can't really do this. Uh, no, what I'll say to myself is, okay, probably I need more rest. Um, I'll probably need to look what I'm eating. I'll probably I need to do something a bit differently. But I always, the, 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 my age should never be a factor. Because, I mean, we all hear stories of people who are in their 80s who are doing the London Marathon. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm quite happy with the 5K. Um, but... Um, it's yeah it's I, I never ever think of my age and and actually I was just thinking of this as well is that when I put my running gear on so I've got my 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 um, little you know, latex trousers on with there and I've got my all my gear on uh, and I'm running and I'm not running constantly I walk a lot as well so I'm doing the run walk thing um I feel really good about myself I think you know what you can do this and um it, it's it proves to me that those other people saying you can't do these things have got it all wrong really and and I think they have you should base a person's um life on on what um on their abilities not mm -hmm. on what you think they should be doing mm -hmm. so I I think that's that's so strongly earlier you talked about confidence and there's this thing called the confidence competence loop right the better you get at something, the more confidence you get. So you have to start to gain the confidence, right? And that's what your that's what your story is. It, it's like maybe what I hear you saying between the lines is why not? Don't you're not expecting yourself to be the best at everything you do. You're just trying all the things you're interested in doing and allowing the, I guess the quote success of it to just be in the doing of it not in the actual outcome like being the first to cross the finish line or to be the best at everything you do that's in between the lines i hear you saying it's more like you're in a candy shop of life and you're just trying to you're trying all the candy yeah. you feel like having yeah i want the experience yeah. i want to know what it's like to run um, i want to know what this run as high is all about i want to know what it's like to stand in a group of people and they're talking about their their split times I mean I had to look up what a split time was earlier on but I had no idea what a split time was so yeah that it's it's all about experiencing life so that when you get to your final day you can look back and say you know what I tried this 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 and this and I had a whale of a time with this and, and that was particularly good now I didn't do too well with that but I did really well over there with this stuff this was really good and I think looking back on how I got here, I think what I did was, as I said, I was always fairly strong academically. So the first thing I did had strong academic links, which was the degree. So it's a safe area for me because I knew schoolwork and academics. So that was, I was really comfortable with that. But it sort of took me get a little bit of confidence when I got the degree. And then from there, I went on to do other things and other things and other things. So I didn't do something that was way outside my my knowledge or my comfort level. Mm -hmm. I did something that I was familiar with, but it just took me up a level. And then I went from there and these other things, well, life happened as well to a certain extent. But I, from that's where my confidence started, I think. Mm hmm it, in, You mentioned the people that surround you and the support or the lack of support. Let's talk a little bit about how how much that mattered to your journey, you know, shifting your environment, finding a different, was that part of how you found yourself living more life? 
Um, yeah, what happened was, um, yes, the people in your life make a huge, huge difference. Um, when I was going through my breakup, my, I, I uh, was doing Toastmasters, you know, the public speaking thing. And um, I still have a very good friend from there. And she um, had gone through the similar thing. And so she was a real support for me. A brand new friend, really. Um, so I had that experience. And then, like I said, with running, I, I talked to running people. Never done that before. Um, every time I, you know, went to the gym and I had my personal trainer, every time I tried something new, I connected with different people. Um, and what I learned as well is that, so your family a good up to a point but they see you a certain way whereas these new people you come across they don't see that old you at all so you don't have to battle any of that oh well uh, this doesn't sound like you type thing mm -hmm. what you do is you 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 just have a lot of like-minded people you become one of them um and so because i've done these different things i've met people in all walks of life and all abilities and um Runners, for example, will say, well, no, you don't have to be the best. Um, it's just a community and uh, you take your time. And um, as long as you do it, that's the main thing. That's the main thing you do. And I think that's that's the thing with life. As long as you do it, that is the main thing. And then you have that experience and then and you grow as a person. Um, you so change and grow because instead of talking to the same people all the time, you're talking to different people who see you differently. I think when I moved here, it was quite funny. Um, my book came out, I think it's about a year after I'm, I'd been here. And I, I thought, oh, yes, I've got this book coming out. I said, oh, you're a published author. Oh, that's, that's um, and I was like a mini celebrity. <laughs> it was like, oh, this is new. I haven't come across this before. And I did a, a live talk recently at one of the libraries. There's only like a handful of people there. And somebody came up to me and said, can I shake your hand? Because he wanted to shake the hands of the person, the author of the book he'd read, because he'd read my family's stories. And it's like, wow, this is different for me. This is okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what life is really about when you break out of what you think mm -hmm. you know. Um, there's so many nice people out there, so many. It's, 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 um, it's been a real eye-opener to me, I have to say. That point you made about how people see you, you know, you don't, you forget, right? We see ourselves the way the people around us see us, don't we? So I suppose when you get outside of that same story that we are used to and you get a different perspective, that must be empowering too, because I would imagine that that gives you the courage to try more. It does. I mean, I'm now to the point where um, I can try anything. Now I prepare for it. I mean, I, I don't, go into something and fail like I, if I need to do training I'll do training or if it's um a sort of academic thing then I'll I'll do all the prep work I do all the preparation work because I don't want to fail outright um but I do want to have the experience um but I don't really have the urge as I said earlier to to be the fastest or the best I just want to do it to the point where I really enjoy it and I can connect with people and they can see that I'm trying and they'll encourage me which 99% of the people out there will do that. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, that that's that's I've, that's the lesson I've learned. I've gone from not really trusting anybody and thinking the world was a terrible place mm -hmm. and thinking that, okay, I, I'm good at one thing, but that's about it. So now thinking, well, you know, I can do things that are not related to what I thought I was. And I do okay, but you do have to put the time in. But that's part of the the fun and the learning. Um, yeah, because if you just show up, for example, and, and you want to run, you'll, you'll get like halfway around and that's it will be a disaster. But you, you have to be kind to yourself. You have to say, I, I'm, I can do this, but I need to do this preparation before I get there. And if you do that, you're going to do a half decent job and people can see that you put the time in and then they'll support you as well. And that, that's why it's been for me for the past 10 years, really. Um, it, there's been ups and downs, but looking back, it's been amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the book because here's one of these things, because I have a podcast, people are like, you should write a book comes up all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm always like, I should write a book about what? Like, I, I'm not going to write a book just to write a book because yeah. I don't like to do things just to do things I like to have some motivation. So I'd love to hear about how this whole thing became a book. Yeah, the book was a surprise to me. Um, what happened was um, my family 
Um, my mum was the youngest of 12 brothers and sisters. So my aunts and uncles over the years had passed on, you know, they died basically. And um, so it got to a point where it was just my mum and uh, one of her sisters left. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. You know, all those stories I used to hear mm -hmm. at the weddings and whenever we got together, oh, did you know about our, our cousin Sansa who got murdered by the mob? Oh, no, mum, do tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing was that we all had great affection for where we lived when we lived in London before we moved down to Bexley Heath where I am now in, in, just outside London really on the outskirts um, and those days at Lamlash Street we used to talk about them over and over and over again and I thought wouldn't it be nice just to write those down because as, as I said all the family members were dying off and so that generation that knew about those things weren't going to be there anymore and I thought you know the way things are going I, I might lose my mind as well and I, I won't be able to remember either so I literally just wrote them down and um, that was the whole idea and I was uh, and I asked mum you know do you remember this and she was like my research assistant I used to say to her because she had all this information in her head <laughs> and I asked around the family so my idea literally was to have all these stories together um, um, I'd have one copy and hopefully one member in the family would uh, take them in and maybe, you know, somebody's grandchild and say, OK, so I'll, I'll, this is like a family memoir sort of thing. And um, they'll keep it as a family thing. Uh, and that's all I thought would happen. Um, but in reality, what happened was um, I was about two thirds of the way through and I was sort of lagging a bit. It's, it's hard writing a book with a lot of time you have to spend on it. And um, the book writing company had come up for self-publishing. And I out of the blue, I said, oh, I'm going to apply for this. So I did. I applied to be a client and they, they got back to me and they accepted me. I was one of their first clients. Um, and then from then, they just rolled with it. So it's like, OK, well, have you finished your book yet? Um, no, I've got some prompts. For this. Would you, uh, OK, so what about book writing coach? So um, so I had a book writing coach and uh, Tim was great. He helped me with the structure of the book. He said, why don't you bookend the story? So it starts with Christmas and it finishes with Christmas. Oh, that's a good idea. And then he said to me, he said, um, you probably need like romance or something in the book. I thought, romance? What are you talking about? He said, now think about this. He said, if, where would the Titanic be if there was no romance? The romance was how you got to see the whole ship. So he said, that's what you need for your book. I thought, oh, good grief. So I said, well, there was one boyfriend, Anthony. She said, that, that's it. That'll do. So then I had to write about romance. So I don't know how to write this, but it's in there. Um, so then the book was finished and then um, they said, oh, what about a cover? I thought, yeah, I've got to have a cover to the book. And so I had to think about all these things I hadn't thought about, let alone the editing and all this thing. And this took place over about three years in total. Um, but the reason I think that I applied to be a client was because at that point I'd, I'd, done, I'd done my degree. Um, I got through the divorce. I'd had a personal train. I'd, I'd made that decision. I was getting used to making my own decisions and, and then I thought, OK, I'm going to do this. I thought, if it doesn't work, I'll just do something else. Um, and it just rolled from there. So, um, yeah, they, these, these little decisions. I mean, I was literally one day I was just checking my emails one day. You know, nothing much to do sort of thing, because I think I was retired at that point. And I saw this this message saying, would you like to be a client? I thought, oh, look at that. And literally I wasn't looking for it. It came to me. It, like I said, sometimes life happens for you. Um, and it came to me and, and I read it, I thought, I'm going to apply. And that's literally all I did. I didn't plan to be an author. I had no idea about podcasts or websites or Facebook. I mean, I used Facebook, but not that way. Um, I had no idea what was, was waiting for me ahead. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that's really how it happened. I didn't, I wasn't going to sit down and write something like Shakespeare wrote or anything. I literally just wrote down some stories from my my life and I knew I had the ability to write at length because I have a thesis no I don't think anyone's actually read it other than my professor did but um, I know I could write and I could take fairly large pieces of information sort of organize it into some sort of sensible thing but that was it that was my only thought process for the whole thing really I had no aspirations to write anything or publish anything <laughs> That's amazing. And you just, you know, you're going to be turning 70 and you published this book at what age? Uh, well, that's uh, three, it's 20, well, it's three years ago. Yeah. So you were 67, 66, somewhere in that range. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, that's incredible because I feel like culturally the way our minds are trained is that 
these kinds of things happen at a certain age, back to the age conversation you had earlier, we tend to put them in boxes of this is when you do this thing. And your story is really like the time that you do the thing is the time when you want to do the thing. (laughs) Well, that's right. I mean, I'm still dating at this time of life. I thought by now I'd be like well into a second marriage or something. And I can remember I just put my poor mom passed on. She said to me, she said, so um, how long are you going to do this dating thing for? I said, well, why, mum? Is there a time limit? Well, I don't know. You know, you're getting on a bit. You know, it's like, really, mum? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're not supposed to. And if you are dating, um, you know, as you're approaching your 70s, it's like, you're not supposed to talk about it, you know. <laughs> People get a bit awkward when you say that. <laughs> so tell me, what is dating uh, close to 70 like? Actually, it's not much different from dating when you're in your thirties or twenties or thirties. To be honest, it's you're still the same person. You're still looking for the same things. Um, you have to learn how to obviously technology. You have to go to match. So you have to have your profile picture. <laughs> you have to have your profile blur put on there. Um, yeah, and but you, the more you do it, the easier it gets. So you know, it's to the point now. Right, I, I'm fairly comfortable meeting people, meeting anybody really. Um, and you know you have to be in a safe place as you would when you're in your 20s and 30s there's very little difference I don't see a huge difference between Mm. them now I mean you know there's some age differences but no um, people are still looking for the same things everyone's looking for you know a a lovely relationship a good relationship Um, everyone's different as to what that is they always were in their 20s and 30s and at this age it's still the same Um, I I tend to date a bit younger than me (laughs) which I find fun um but yeah it's um it's I I I, I, so I I get annoyed sometimes that people think that after a certain age it's like oh no you can't do that anymore it's like yes you can do it if you've looked after yourself you can do any of this stuff if you sit there and just you know don't look after your fitness level um and don't look after your life then no you can't do those things it's more related to how you run your life than the number on your your birthday, basically. Mm. I love that message. And again, you know, just the fact that you're not just saying you can, you're actually living it out. And I love that you have this open mindset because you're like, what's next, right? So let's let's spend a minute thinking, if you could do anything right now, Jill, if you could do anything, what what would that be? What are a couple of things you would love to do? Oh, what would I love to do? I'm still mulling these over because I've got to outdo myself, you see, and that's really annoying. Um, I do want to do, I'd love to do like a round the world cruise. I'd like to see a bit more of the world, to be honest. Um, I, I'd love to have, I'd love to go, I've done a few beach holidays, like Caribbean beach holidays and that, and I'd like to do more of that. Um, but it's got to see, I've done so much in such a short period of time. I'm struggling as to what this next thing. I have a bucket list which is, you know, it's okay as a bucket list, but it's not, I'm looking for that extraordinary thing. I think if anything, um, with with my next book, I mean, I I think I'll do a book to follow up the one I've done, but I I also find I'm talking more and more about, I didn't think I was that different to be honest, but how different I am from a lot of people my age, put it that way. Um, And I I think I'd like to pick up on that more. And and I love telling people, like I love saying, do what you really want to do in life. Do the preparation. You have to do that. Um, and you may have to adapt how you do it, but you can do anything you want to do. If you want to go skydiving, um, I don't, by the way, but if you do want to do skydiving, I would say, well, you know, at some point in life, you maybe want to do like a the buddy skydiving where you're on the back of somebody else sort of thing, rather than sort of go by yourself. Um, but yeah, to do anything you want to do, but you may have to adapt it somewhat, but have the experience. That's the real thing. Mm-hmm. Um so, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do in my own future here because I've, I've gone through all these things and that's like mm, scratching my head, really trying to see what else. I'm, I'm not really into extreme sports. <laughs> that's not really what I want to do. Um, but I think I'd probably increase my sphere of influence would be good as well because um, that's something I've done to a certain extent um, and I get a lot of fun out of it. I love breaking down people's stereotypes. <laughs> that's the thing I absolutely love to do. Well, and, and you've, I listened to you on a different podcast. So now you're, you are spreading that message and you are becoming kind of that light in the, you're that voice in the crowd that raises your hand and says, you can do things differently. 
And I would love for you to share maybe three things that you would like my audience to really take home from your experience. Like, what would you want them to really anchor into, Jill? Um, Okay, first thing is never give up. You are never, ever too old. I know people have said that before, but I'm sitting here in my grand old age and I can tell you, and especially now more than anything, because people now I think are slightly more open to us doing things we really want to do. Um, So certainly never give up. Um, I think what I'd like this to take as well is like, don't look at me as somebody who's this different person. I'm not. Um, I wasn't this naturally outgoing, bubbly personality or however this comes across. I was very shy, very, very quiet, um, very held in. Um, and if I can break out, anybody can break out. But, and then the third thing that I mentioned before, I will emphasize this is do your preparation. Because if you don't, you're going to fail and don't set yourself up to fail. Always, always do the preparation. So whatever it is you want to do, make sure um, if you're going to the gym, you've got the right gym equipment, you've got the right information. Don't go to the gym and and, um, strain something and then you, you, oh, no, I can't do this. Make sure you do the correct um, preparation for everything you do. Like the running, it took me forever, but nonetheless, I got there in the end. Um, The thesis I could write because of my whole life I'd written so make sure you do the preparation before you get there because um, you're going to be disappointed and then you'll give up on yourself and mm. there's enough people out there waiting for you to fail anyway so just so that'd be my third thing do the preparation mm. would you say that your perspective is less about failure and more about experience, like you, you, you shifted that languaging. It sounds like you don't see anything as a failure. You see it more as like a, well, that was interesting. Or, you know, you just had that experience. Yeah, you learn, you learn, you learn, um, you do. Um, everything you do, you learn from. When I'm talking about preparation, I'm saying make sure you do the basics so that when you show up, you can show up and, and have, you know, you will be able to achieve it. You may not be the fastest or the best, but you will achieve it. And you will have some conversation with people who are, that's their area of interest. Mm-hmm. So make sure that you do that sort of preparation. But yeah, I mean, you do, you learn. Whatever happens, you learn. Um, and then if you're smart, you listen to what you learn about and then you move on. <laughs> we're hoping that that comes with age, right? Like we're figuring that piece out. <laughs> uh, so- you know what? It's, it's a struggle. <laughs> so let me, t- let me ask you, Jill, how can people find you? and get a hold of your book okay so um easy one my book is on amazon it's lamla street l-a-m-l-a-s-h street um and it's on amazon.com and .co.uk and .ca so i've covered all three countries um and you just actually if you just put lamlash in as a word and google it it's such an unusual word it'll pop up anyway and I have a, a an author's web page as well. So it's jmphillipsauthor.com. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Jill, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing with me your story and just shining your light for women who don't want to wind down, who want to live a vibrant life, who want to experience things. And and it's so encouraging to have someone like you who says, hey, you can do it. Here's what I've done. This is how I've done it. And it's it's such a gift that you've brought to us today. And I really have fully enjoyed getting to know you and spending this time together. Thank you for coming. That was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Friends, today, if you are wanting to get connected with Jill, you can head on over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 320. I will have links to Jill there. If you're on YouTube, just look down below. Everything is in the description beneath so you can get a hold of her and read that story. Friends, this is one of those conversations where, you know, what we experience in life really is based on what we believe we can and cannot do. The way we think about ourselves and our life powerfully impacts and then the community that we surround ourselves with either empowers or disempowers us by their beliefs so really consider what is it that you want to do and don't let anybody tell you you can't unless it's a doctor and you really need to listen (laughs) might need to listen to them but you know jill said 
you can do anything you put your mind to do the preparation and go ahead and go for it. Friends, we'd love to hear some of your stories. What are some of the things that you're doing after the age of 50 that you never thought that you would do? Maybe you're going to write a book. Maybe you're going to write some music. Maybe you're going to make some art. Maybe you're going to travel the world. Whatever it is, why not go for it? You're here. You got things to do. Let's get these things done and live a life more fully and more vibrantly. Thank you so much, friends, for being here today and for listening. And I would love to share more inspirational people, conversations, and topics with you in the future. So please don't forget to subscribe and join me each week. Thank you so much, friends. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.